1245 star, right? Yes, we're ready to go when you are. Uh, we're a little early, aren't we? Hey, Ron, it's 1247. I have 1240. Oh, you're right. Wow. My phone, my uh, phone is off. That's uh, weird. <laughs> okay. Uh, everyone, welcome to the Metro Line of Trauma Advisory Committee Multidisciplinary Conference for the month of June. Uh, today's talk will be given to us by Dr. Graydon Stellar, Chess Trauma Management at a Level 3 Trauma Center. Uh, this is very relevant as we have five Level 3 Trauma Centers within our region. Uh, Dr. Dr. Stellar trained at the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine for his medical degree and then went on to Mount Cummins uh, <coughs> Medical Center for internship and surgical residency and then performed a trauma and surgical critical care fellowship at the University of Illinois College of Medicine from uh, 2013 to 2014. He's been in our region uh, for a number of years and now the medical director for the Level 3, uh, level three Trauma Center <coughs> at uh, Caramount. Uh, so, uh, Stallard, take it away. Thank you. Hey, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm, I'm really uh, honored to be able to do this, um, actually. Uh, and it's kind of at an appropriate time for us because we are having some discussions in our program as to certain aspects of chest trauma management. And so this is a perfect time for us to present what we do and to get everybody else's opinions on what they do at their centers, uh, being that we have different levels of trauma centers involved, it's gonna be a good day for us. So uh, like, like he said, I am uh, the new trauma medical director here at Caremont Regional Medical Center. I did not create this program, nor have I made it the well-oiled machine that it is today. Um, I'm trying to work my PowerPoint, but I'm a lot better with a scalpel than I am with a computer. <laughs> Bear with me. There we go. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about, about Caremont Regional Medical Center. Currently, we are a 435 bed rural hospital in Gastonia, and everybody knows from Saturday Live that Charlotte is the gateway to Gastonia. Um, I'll pause for dramatic effect on that one. But we have recently been given uh, per permission from the state for another total of 146 beds that we're currently working on placing in different locations. We have a four-story critical care tower that's expanding over our operating room right now, and that's this uh, projected to be finished around 2023. We have a standalone emergency department in Mount Holly, which is pretty busy. <coughs> uh, the only bad thing about that is when you're having a really good quiet night at the main hospital, Mount Holly blows you up. Uh, we're also constructing a new hospital in Belmont that's absolutely gorgeous. It's right off the highway. You'll see all the construction as you're driving by. And that's, uh, subject, that's projected to be finished in 2024. Uh, the reason why they had to delay is apparently there are uh, issues getting certain supplies. I guess everybody can understand that. So I want to talk a little bit about then and now, because like I said, I am the interim trauma medical director and I just took this role uh, less than two months ago. Uh, but it's important that I talk about where we started because I did not build this program. Started with Drs. James O'Connor uh, and followed up and matured by Dr. Respani, who turned it into the center that it is today. They uh, mostly, I was not here for Dr. O'Connor, so I can't speak to exactly what he did, but I have been here for most of uh, Respani's career as the trauma medical director. And he was, he was instrumental in initiating our trauma services treatment guidelines and building a trauma service staff of critical care surgeons to complement the full staff of general surgeons who all take trauma call. And they're all very good surgeons, in my opinion. Uh, they 
uh, responding cultivated a partnership with Gaston County Emergency Medical Services. We call them GEMS, who are, uh, they are a lifeline to our county. They bring everybody to us and they do a very good job at that. So I'd like to commend GEMS for their work. Uh, and Responding also developed relationships with level one trauma centers and specialty burn centers that has allowed us to uh, rapidly provide transfer to our, uh, for our patients to higher levels of care when needed. Uh, we are proud to say that we are able to accept trauma transfers from other hospitals, uh, which became more, uh, it became more frequent during the COVID crisis when everybody was strapped for beds. We uh, opened up our doors and everything seemed to go really well. Uh, so here's a year in review for our center at our level three trauma center. Um, you can see on the left the number of patients that come in each month over the year with thoracic or lung injuries. And obviously, April and September are not good months for Gaston County. Um, not many of them receive any, any intervention, but when they do, usually it's a chest tube or uh, rib plating. We have, we have a few thoracotomies, but not, not as much as the big level one trauma centers normally do. Uh, the number of people transferred to higher levels of care, I'm very proud of. They all are in you know, single digits, and we try to keep as many people here at our center as possible. But I am also very grateful for the partnerships with the, the level one trauma centers that, that we have that are willing and able to take and take care, to, to receive and take care of the patients that we are unable to take care of, uh, whether it's because we just don't have the, the uh, the surgeons that we need, or we just don't have the room. Um, and most of our patients are thankfully discharged alive. However, some are discharged dead. But I'm also proud to say that the ones with the asterisks are the ones that died in the ED, not in our OR. So I'm proud about that. I got to hold on to that one. OK, so the average age of chest trauma patients in Gaston County. It's in the 50s, so uh, I'm going to stay away from my 50s. I'm just going to go straight from my 20s, where I am now, <laughs> into my 60s. Uh, but the 50s uh, tend to be the average age. But what you can see is April and September, they are our worst months, if you can if you remember from the previous slide. And those are where the 90-year-olds are. So I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying that the 90 year olds probably shouldn't be walking in April or September if they don't want some chest trauma. That leads me into the geriatric patients. So we do not have a geriatric trauma service at, at our level three trauma center. However, we do have a great relationship with our medicine hospitalists who we get involved very early. It's usually patients over the age of 60 or patients with severe, like with multiple uh, medical comorbidities and what they do is they manage the medical comorbidities for us and they assist with discharge planning so that we can concentrate on the entire trauma team and know that our geriatric patients are being taken care of by qualified physicians that won't let things slip through the cracks. I would be really interested if uh, in hearing about any centers that might have a dedicated geriatric trauma program or a trauma team and how uh, that's, that's ran. So here at our center, we manage our chest injuries pretty much like anybody else would, I think. Um, we do it non-operatively, and then we do it uh, operatively. So non-operatively, we, we try to use multimodal pain control with IV, PO, topical, epidural, intercostal nerve blocks, uh, and we promote pulmonary toilet with incentive use and making sure we stay on our lazy patients, uh, that they're, they're actually performing at their predicted level and using flutter valves and uh, PTOT is very crucial with, with these patients as well. Um, the majority of our chest trauma patients are managed in this manner and they do, they do well. But there are some chest trauma patients that need to have interventions done. So our invasive management, the majority of them at our center, and I'm pretty sure throughout the nation, is uh, traditional chest tubes. However, the reason why I was excited to give this lecture today is because we have a lot of people who are really interested in giving the pigtail catheter. And for the surgeons out there who trained, you know, when I did or before, uh, long before, 
uh, you'll you'll remember getting yelled at by your attendings whenever you try to put a pigtail catheter in. So it's kind of one of those sore subjects you just don't want to uh, let into your life. But that's what we are discussing at our center right now. The two uh, thoracostomies, however, are placed in all patients that are unstable. And the preference for anybody with a hemothorax at our center is still to give a chest tube. Uh, and it's usually between a 20 to 28 French. That's what we most commonly put in here. Oh, sorry, man, I gave it away. Okay. So the 14 French pigtail catheters at Caremont, we do use them. Uh, they're, they're placed often in the emergency department. However, they're placed with pneumothorax without hemothorax components. Uh, the reason why is because of the, the fear of the risk of failure uh, and the necessity for a placement of a chest tube on the floor when trying to get, you know, sedation and you have nurses say you can't give that drug on this floor, then you have to try to get the patient transferred down to a monitor floor or to the PACU uh, just so that you can place a chest tube on a patient who might not be doing too hot. So that's the biggest fear that we have. Um, what you're seeing is an image of a patient that we actually did have a chest tube, uh, or sorry, a pigtail placed um, but the, the pneumothorax did not resolve. So let's talk about the chest tubes. Is bigger better? Really? Um, before 2012, let's look at the history uh, of this. Before 2012, the, the go-to was between a 36 and a 40 French chest tube. Current ATL, ATLS recommendations are 28 to 32 French for hemothoraces, and the 14 French pigtails are acceptable for traumatic pneumothoraces. But everybody's trying to push the envelope and has been doing so since 2012 when Ken Naba and his team found that there was no difference in clinical outcomes, including retained hemothoraces and uh, when comparing smaller versus larger tubes. And his, his uh, groups were 28 to 32 French versus 36 to 40 French tubes. In 2014, Kobe and his group found that 14 French pigtail catheters were more comfortable for the patients with traumatic pneumothoraces. In 2018, Bauman and his team found that pigtail catheters were similar to the larger, catheter, or the larger chest tubes in terms of the initial output, the insertion-related complications, 8.5% 8 8 of the pigtails had insertion complications, and 5% of the chest tubes had complications. And the failure rates they found were pretty similar to 21% for the pigtails and 24% for the chest tubes. And the pigtail catheter patients were found to have uh, uh, be less likely to require a VAT for retaining hemothorax, 4% versus 13%. I, I found that interesting. And in 2021, Colvin Tunyu and his team uh, did a multi-center study with five institutions, and they looked at 119 patients randomized to either 14 French pigtails, and there were 56 of those, versus 28 to 32 French chest tubes, and there were 63 of them. And they found no difference between pigtail catheters and chest tubes in terms of the, uh, effective treatment of traumatic <coughs> hemothorax. And of course, the pigtail catheters are associated with improved patient experience. I found that interesting. Now, I have to do it. <laughs> Caremont surgeons were the first state in North Carolina to use the minimally invasive blue, uh, blue fix advantage. And that's only because I didn't have to jump. Me and Dr. Respani, who's the better looking guy on the left, did not have to jump through a bunch of hoops to get it going. We just had to ask and we did it the next day. So it was only because we were lucky, not because we were good. But we, we did do the first blue rid, uh, blue fix advantage case here, which was really awesome. So let's, that, that segues us into the surgical stabilization of rib fractures for Caramon, or for patients here at Caramon. And this is another topic that we're discussing at our institution because what we're finding is that with the limited amount of surgeons that we have doing the procedure, we're having a hard time getting the volume to be 
you know, to, to help as many patients as we can, because if only one surgeon is doing it, as of right now, there's only one of us doing it because Dr. Respani has, uh, has left. Um, if there's only one of us doing it, if I'm not in, in house or if I'm on vacation, then a patient who may need fixation is not going to be a candidate. But we do use the RIPFIX Blue for our open procedures and our RIPFIX Advantage uh, for the uh, minimally invasive. And we are also doing cryoablation of the intercostal nerves as well for uh, uh, assistance with postoperative pain. And that seems to work very well uh, with the patients that we've used it on. I'd be curious to see what everybody else's experience on that is uh, with the cryoablation of the intercostal nerves after the lecture. What I like to do is uh, I found that ultrasound guidance locates fractures of the ribs very, very easily. It's awesome. However, it's very painful if the patient's not asleep. So what I do is I use ultrasound guidance to locate the fractures preoperatively once the patient's asleep and positioned. Uh, that way I can go to town with the ultrasound without fear of putting the patient in agony. Uh, now, the, the previous recommendations included patients, you know, uh, the previous recommendations for patients to undergo surgical fixation or stabilization is that they had a flailed chest, either with paradoxical respirations or a flailed chest on imaging. Different papers said different things. Um, or if the patient was unable to be liberated from the ventilator. Um, but that, at our level three trauma center, limits the volume that we can do as well. So if we are going by those uh, criteria, we're not doing a lot of these. However, there are a lot of people doing them. And so more studies were, were done to find out, okay, is the volume of rib fixation going up? Is it appropriate? If it is, what do we look at to make sure that it's the safest way we can do it possible? So um, the question was raised, okay, so what about fixing rib fractures that are not flail. And uh, they, there is a paper out looking at sequential clinical assessment of respiratory function or the SCARF scale, and that's a total of four points. And you get one point for each of the following. If your incentive spirometry is less than, 50, if your patient's incentive spirometry is less than 50% and predicted, then you get a point. Respiration rate greater than 20, you get a point. Numeric pain scale greater than five, uh, you get a point, and inadequate cough, you get a point. Now, this study showed that 100 ICU patients with non flail rib fracture patterns uh, that had a SCARF score, or that showed that their SCARF score actually did closely relate to or correlate to uh, pneumonia, prolonged SICU length of stays, and need for supplemental oxygen. Therefore, they found that a patient with a SCARF score greater than two are candidates for rib fixation, not for patients with non-flail injuries. And there's a picture of your scarf there. So then, if you can remember, there was a time not too long ago where we didn't think that octogenarians would do well because they just can't tolerate the surgery. But Pieracci and his team found that patients over the age of 80 were less likely to tolerate the morbidity of severe chest wall injuries managed non-operatively, but they did pretty well with the minimally invasive approaches that are now available to us, like the rib fix advantage that we have. Um, in my experience, I have done octogenarian rib plating, but what I have found in one patient, and it's only been one patient, uh, but the bones would, the ribs would not hold screws. They would just crack like it would just crack. It would not hold screws. So we had to abort the procedure, uh, but that only happened once to me. I'd be curious to see if anybody else has had that experience, and if so, how they corrected that. So let me talk about a few cases that we've had here. This is a 57-year-old male who fell down 30 steps while intoxicated. He was uh, left with the left anterior 6th through ninth fractures, and the posterior 6th through 10th fractures. We took him to the OR, and as you can see on the right, we did rib fix blue fixation uh, of his chest. And I am happy to report that, as you know, trauma is a recurring disease. Uh, so this gentleman has been readmitted to our hospital multiple times for assault to the chest. And he's had no further fractures on that side. So I, I just I think that's hilarious. Um, 
they held up another assault. This case is a 59 year old female who fell off of a mule. She had left posterior third through nine minimally displaced fractures, but anterior four through nine displaced fractures posteriorly. Sorry, uh, anteriorly. No, sorry, they are posterior displaced, anteriorly minimally displaced. I have a typo, sorry. But we plated the fourth through eighth with the rib fixed blue. She did well and was discharged home, had no complications uh, shortly thereafter. This is a 61 year old male who was at work and got crushed by a forklift at work. He developed left second through seventh rib <coughs> fractures with a pretty bad scapular fracture. Uh, we externally plated him uh, anteriorly from three to seven with cryoablation of the intercostal nerves because his pain was unbearable. He was not doing well. Uh, we plated him cryoablation. Worked amazingly with this gentleman. The only complaint he had was his skin of his chest walls felt numb, but he had no pain post-op, which it, it was pretty amazing. I, that, that was our first intercostal nerve cryoablation case that made me a believer. Um, and I, I'd be curious to see if anybody else is ha having the same results consistently with their cryoablation. And we used the Riflex Blue on him as well. This is the first case in North Carolina that was done minimally evasive with the rib fix advantage. He's a 40 year old male who is working on a roof and fell off the 20 foot roof and developed left third through eighth rib fractures. He had significant respiratory embarrassment and, se and severe pain. We could not control it with any measures that we tried. Uh, therefore, we used the rib fix advantage uh, on the left three through six rib fractures. And he actually did really well also. I followed him for a good three, no, a good four to six months uh, just to make sure that he was fine, make sure that he got back to work okay. Um, and that was a very, very cool case because uh, we were using big incisions and this allowed us to use much smaller incisions and spare much more muscle. Uh, it was it was very awesome. If you're not using the rib fix advantage or something minimally basin like it, I, I highly recommend you doing it. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties with my slide. There we go. Damage control thoracotomies. When I was a resident, I loved these. But luckily, we don't have to do many of these at our level three trauma center. That being said, we just did one two weeks ago. Um, but usually we do not have to do most of these damage control uh, thoracotomies. However, it's always in the back pocket with the tractotomies, with the cardiac massage and all the other good things that come with those thoracotomies. So I do have questions for the audience, and here are my questions. Are you currently using pigtail catheters at your institution versus chest tubes? And if you are, what are your criteria for? Um, are you using the hemothoraces? Are you finding that they are working? Who else in your group or in your hospital is performing rib fixations? Uh, is it just one person, two people, or is it a group of people that's allowing the volumes to be higher so that we can get patients in uh, the recommended time, which is about within injury to 48 hours is when the recommended repair time is. So we're having an issue getting in that 48 hour window with only one surgeon doing this procedure. And uh, uh, the cryoablation, are you guys using it? If so, how are your, how are your outcomes with this? And what's your experience with the octogenarians, with the, the rib fixations, as well as do you guys have an octogenarian trauma service? Um, that's uh, that's my, my lecture. I'm going to come back to these questions so you guys can look at them and give me any feedback if possible. Hi, can you hear me? Thank yep. you uh, very much for that talk. So I think the, the uh, I'll I'll comment on the first question and uh, leave it to the audience for their somebody's. But I think one, uh, I 14 French chest tubes. I, I think the concept is the fact that if it's fluid, it's going to come out no matter what size it is. If it's a clot, it's not going to come out no matter what size it is. So I think there are definite advantages to 14 French catheters, or or at least 
but he, he used the old fashioned 40 or 36 French. Painful, and one of the things I think we we're beginning to show in some of our, you know, maybe if Brad Thomas is on, can comment, is that the use of pneumothorax after chest tube removal is obviously higher on the larger tubes as well. Uh, I think there is a potential problem with the 14 French catheters is they tend to get kinked a lot easier, which on the floor can be devastating. So uh, something, uh, maybe there's a uh, design issue that could be addressed there. But I think overall, I think the pigtail chest tube catheters seem to be well. Um, for the SSRF, uh, we have a large group of SSRF. Actually, we now, uh, for our for the 2022 academic year, actually have uh, one of our, fa at least one of our faculty, seven days a week on service for rib fixation, which is uh, obviously challenging you know, smaller uh, centers uh, as well. And I think that's uh, really helpful. Uh, the comment on cryoablation, I think we're, we've been uh, showing very successful outcomes. There is a particular some of them show a little bit later, but we're beginning to address some of those issues as well. And uh, interestingly, as you comment on the oxygenarian issue for this, we are pending an IRB uh, approval, hopefully this week, on looking at very elderly, particularly the oxygenarians, and, and 90 plus. So I saw Dr. Uh, uh, Diefenbauer on, uh, if he wants to get out the garden. Sean, are you out there? When I was just checking attendance, he was on hold. He may be dealing with a clinical duty. Dr. Coupler uh, writes in the chat that he prefers a 14 yeah. French pigtail. Yeah, Chris, do you have any, you have a chance to get on uh, on here to comment? Any of the other uh, regarding your comments regarding 14 French catheter? Hey, uh, I was, uh, this is Chris Coupler, um, just hey, Chris. Uh, was uh, going to say that uh, yeah, we've had a uh, we've had a good experience. Uh, first of all, a great and great talk, um, and uh, we've had a great experience with uh, using. <clears throat> I think the uh, 14 French, and I, I come from the same era as uh, as you, Graydon, where I still have PTSD from some attendings yelling at me for uh, uh, using for for not using a you know a, a, a 34 36 French chest tube, um, but obviously patients prefer that much better. And and exactly what Doctor Singh said, uh, the data seems to support that. Uh, liquid will drain through to regardless of uh, of its diameter, and uh, uh, we've had we've had pretty good success with uh, with the fourteen French pigtails. Um, I do think that the uh, having the whole group who who uh, does it and and being able to switch out rib call um, from one person to the next uh, helps to uh, uh, helps to make sure that that a large amount of patients who otherwise wouldn't, uh, you know, would be dependent on uh, kind of what day of the week they came in on uh, now are, are getting, uh, getting plated. And I think that, uh, that that's been uh, very helpful. Um, Dr. Thomas is uh, kind of who's heading up that group and uh, he's been doing a great job with that. I think uh, Dr. Lauer and uh, our team has some, and maybe Dr. Thomas has some data about the cryo being helpful. I think it has been, helpful in our post-op patients and uh, um, uh, I guess Sean isn't uh, isn't available to come uh, talk right now but um, I, I think the uh, a lot of the data does uh, seem to increasingly uh, point towards uh, fixing the uh, octogenarians who who have uh, bad fracture patterns but just like you said the big I think that big worry is uh, that bone just uh, not being able to take a screw, and that's one of the biggest uh, uh, concerns that that I have. I I would uh, I wouldn't know what to do if I if I got in that situation. But it'll be interesting to see uh, uh, if we're able to get that IRB through. What what our uh, data shows out of here? And uh, again, great talk, Graydon. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. 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 Thank you,
Thanks. Please keep me updated on on the that study. That that's really interesting because it is it is crazy when you're in there and the bones are just riddling away at you. It, it, it's kind of nerve wracking. Are there any level three trauma centers on the on the call right now that are actually doing rig fixations? And if so, are you having an issue with the volume of surgeons that are doing it at your institution? This is Dee from Novant Presbyterian in Charlotte. We do rib fixations here, but our thoracic team does it. Uh, yeah. Okay. And do they do them? Uh, how many surgeons do you have there doing them? Um, I'm not sure exactly. I would say probably two for sure. I'll have to check on that. I'm not sure how many are on that team. We usually consult them and they make the decision to take them for the fixation or not. We honestly don't do a whole lot. I mean, probably maybe two to three a year. Ooh. Uh, you want to comment on the number of uh, SSRF cases we're doing almost weekly now. We're probably doing at least two cases a week by my estimate. You said two cases per week? Uh, yeah, at least. My goal is my goal here is to try to train all of my partners to get them. Not our volumes up to the to where we're doing multiple cases a week. You said that. What was that? Uh, we. I think that at, at, I mean at least at uh, CMC Maine we've been doing uh, we've been doing several. I mean it, it almost seems like uh, uh, anywhere between two and four cases a week of uh, rib rib fixation. It just so happens that whenever I'm on, they decide not to come in. <laughs> And that's, uh, that's the problem if you're if you're not on and they come in and you're the only one doing it. That's where I'm finding the, the issue. So I've discussed it with my partners and the majority of them are interested in learning it. So I'm going to get them all on board with this so that we can have rib call like you guys do. Dr. Elizabeth from Cabarrus, another level three, says two of their seven surgeons do them. It, we we are uh, Addison, uh, as uh, Scott mentioned, we do some at Cabarrus now, and we are <clears throat> in process of trying to uh, increase the number of people there that can do them as well. Um, I would say um, I do know the numbers uh, from. April 25th through uh, June 16th, uh, we did 50 SSRF cases. Uh, so that's uh, what, how many days is that about? That's about a 50 day, a little more than a 50 day period. So we're doing about one per day at present. You do one a day with two surgeons? No, no, no. It, it, here, that's uh, 50 is here at, here at CMC. Cabarrus uh, uh, is a level three. They're trying to expand the number of surgeons they have there to do it. Uh, right now, they only have two surgeons uh, who are actively doing it. That's really impressive. What a day is impressive. Thank you for the input. Well, again, I think one of the one of the uh, opportunities we, we have, obviously, uh, of a, a more expansive faculty, uh, which are uh, uh, definitely an advantage center as opposed to a level three center where. Uh, many of the practices are are, are partially trauma focused, where mostly acute care, surgical, and actually elective general surgical practices within that mix. So I think there's obviously a resource opportunity there that uh, makes it uh, challenging. So one one of the other particular advantages of having a basically a 24/7 SSRF service is the ability to 
for our ability to keep and then therefore decrease length of stay or even ICU ventilator days. At, at, at Atrium, are you guys are you guys going by the scarf? Are you using the checking scarf scores to do non-flail segments as well? Or what are you guys using for your criteria? You have the disadvantage of, I think, uh, almost all the guys who are doing a big volume are off. I see Sean just raised his hand, so we must be available again. Sean. Hey, y'all. Sorry, chasing kids around. So, uh, great and great talk. Yeah, I mean, in terms of our criteria, we evaluate based on uh, morphological criteria based on the CT scan. And then our physiologic criteria we use is a modified PIC score. It doesn't differ all that much from your SCARF score. Uh, but evaluates their physiology, their cough, their pain control, and that's both with multimodal and regional analgesia, and, and we follow that score uh, sequentially through their first 24 hours. I think the keys uh, for us is, is constant coverage, and that's obviously the biggest struggle for our level three centers and for you guys, is that constant coverage and avoiding uh, gaps in care. Uh, the data clearly recognizes that uh, early intervention is key. Uh, and that's for avoiding all the downstream implications. Um, I, you know, I think your questions right here that you've listed are, are spot on, uh, which is how many how many does it take to really perform a to build a program? And that number is probably somewhere around four surgeons. Uh, we have eight or nine, depending on who's around uh, on a particular time that we rotate through. Uh, in terms of cryoablation, again, uh, I think we're the highest volume center for cryoablation in the country. At least that's the last numbers from Atricure. And so we've got a great opportunity to study that. So stay tuned there. And I think, unfortunately, I've become the uh, old person expert on rib fractures. Uh, and so there are a number of techniques uh, that we use in, in dealing with osteopenic bone or osteoporotic bone. And, and some of that is long plating and skipping holes and circlaging the plates uh, versus deciding what system you're going to use. Some of the systems, uh, the screws themselves exert more radial force on the bone. And so in a young person, you can get away with more force exerted radially, whereas in the osteopenic bone, uh, you got to be as careful as you can. And so sometimes that includes pre-drilling those those holes, uh, long plating, which is skipping holes and kind of go into a 12 hole plate where you're skipping every other hole uh, and then circlaging with suture. So those are probably techniques at some point uh, we can get you to one of our courses and, and sort of talk about uh, osteopenic bone and I think it opens up lots of opportunities for collaboration uh, for us to kind of help you guys uh, along uh, to develop a program. Thanks. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, just a, a question regarding the we've had uh, historically in the past uh, with involvement of thoracic surgery, is there a particular elective schedule and leading to uh, potential delays in their input or operative intervention, particularly BATS, which is uh, surgical uh, credentialing at this point. So I think the, the length of stay or delay to surgery is uh, much more rapid uh, for whether it's a retained hemothorax or a BATS, because we're going you know, or the rib fixation. Now, here's what the uh, are related to the SSR being performed by the thoracic surgeon. It's interesting. We didn't hear most of what you said. It was cutting out. Oh, I, I'm sorry. So the, the, the question is, I, I'm, I'm curious about In light of the fact that that's a uh, pretty much an electrical team, which may cause a delay. Ron, we caught in and out, but maybe maybe I'll guess at part of your question if I'm not cutting in and out. Uh, I think he was asking uh, about the thoracic. Uh, surgery and whether they're able uh, to do it consistently uh, at the at their engagement. 
Uh, at Caramon, our thoracic surgeons don't want anything to do with it, so we don't have that problem or that luxury. Because if they would, if they would want to be involved, then that would be two more surgeons that I could have on our our rib call. But they don't want anything to do with this, so I'm I'm building the team with the surgeons that we have in our our trauma, trauma program. And luckily for me, they're all eager to get on board with this, so I'm very excited about our future here. I know Novant, uh, their cardiothoracic surgeons were doing it. I'm not sure what the delay there is, because you're right, the cardiothoracic surgeons are usually more uh, trying to do things electively than more urgently within the first 48 hours. But I'm not sure how their response is. Their response is good once we consult them. What initially kind of how they start out is we start out, we we pretty much follow the typical guideline where we try the multimodal pain management initially, and then if we need to, we'll consult thoracic to determine if they want to do rib, rib plating. So that's kind of the process that we have in place. And once they're consulted, they there's no delay. They come quickly and do it. Great. I don't have anything else. Great talk. Thank you for uh, giving it. Thank uh, you thank for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Dr. Singer, are you there? All right, I'll close this out then. Dr. Stoward and uh, Sherry at Caramont and your team, thank you very much uh, for this talk. It was really informative uh, to, to learn y'all's practice and the discussion afterwards. If there's no other uh, other questions or uh, or comments in the chat, uh, take note of Dr. Jacobs' uh, uh, comment about the uh, ACS COT resident trauma paper competition, and there's an abstract looking at cryoablation for patients with rib fractures. So if you need more information, check that link out or reach out to Dr. Jacobs. Great. If there's nothing else, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.